when um, the, the call came to, to, to join Rory, what happened there? Tell me about how that came about. I was back in Belfast. I mean, we'd lived in London for, for a year. I mean, the band I was with, Deep Joy, we went over and we ended up in the same stable as, as, as Rory, as, as Taste, uh, Robert Stigwood organisation. He took care of Cream and the Bee Gees and so yeah. on. And so we ended up doing a, a few shows together with uh, with Taste, opening for Taste. So we, sort of, so we got a, I got acquainted a little bit with, with Rory, you know, and over, over the, those months in 1970. Uh, and then towards the end of 1970, we, we were still sort of playing the clubs in London. Uh, and Rory and his brother Donald came down a couple of times. There was a club in Kensington called Blazes, quite famous in the 60s and the 70s. And, and Rory and his brother came down. I just thought they were just, you know, coming down just to you know, have, a, have, a, have a pint and, and a chat. And that was it. And then, um, as I say, the, my band, Deep Joy, split up uh, New Year's Eve, 1970. So uh, 1971, I, I wasn't doing anything. I didn't know what I wanted to do mm -hmm. because uh, <clears throat> the year in London was uh, was on a starvation diet, so I didn't particularly fancy going to come back to that again. Uh, and I, I think it was towards the end of January, I got a call. And I thought it was Wilger, who was the drummer with uh, Deep Joy, who stayed in London. And it was Rory. He said, Jerry, how you doing? I said, oh, Rory, good to hear from you, so and so on. And a couple of niceties chatting away. And then at the end of the conversation, he said, do you fancy come on over to London to have a bit of a jam and a bit of a blow? So I'm thinking, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, that's, that, that, that was the initial um, get together. I mean, so I flew over to London and we met up in a, a tiny little studio in, uh, in Fulham, uh, Fulham Palace Road, actually, <clears throat> a little recording studio. And... Um, Wilgie was already there, Rory was there, and Donald picked me up at the airport, Rory's brother, picked, and we drove down there and went in, and we jammed for about three hours, three or four hours, you know? Oh. And we just, you know, blues, rock and roll, you know, not nothing, none of Rory's songs. I mean, it was just a, a, an out and out It was great. Yeah. It was great. You know? and, and plus the fact, I mean, I was a fan when I was growing up as a kid in Belfast. I mean, I was a fan of Taste, Mark One and Mark Two. Yeah. So to be standing there with, with this guy, you know, like, and, and playing with him and realizing how good he was <laughs> that's the other thing as well. i was going to say that because obviously you said you're on the same bill you, you did shows together you've obviously seen him play live and everything like that so when you get the phone call off him i mean what was your what was your early thoughts of of, of rory as a person then having watched him play guitar and then suddenly you're there, you're there alongside him i mean I, I i mean as i said i was a fan i mean i thought he was fabulous i mean i you know you know coming from Belfast, because they, they, they moved out to Belfast from Cork, uh, Taste Mark 1, and so we'd see him in the clubs and, and that, you know. And um, to have the invitation to come over and, and, and play with the guy, I'm thinking, God oh, almighty, this is amazing, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I, as a musician, I, I, you know, later years, I realised how good a songwriter he was, you know, but as a musician, as a guitar player, he was fantastic. He, he was he yeah. was, was one-off, absolutely. Absolutely. And you talk about musician and songwriters. How, how did the process work then? Because obviously you did many studio albums with him. Did he come in with a song and say, this is what we're doing today? Or, or was it more collaborative? How, how did that sort of thing work out with you guys? No, we'd rehearse, uh, say for the first album, we rehearsed uh, in the same little studio that uh, we had the jam session. In. And Rory would come in. He wouldn't sort of, a, you know, he wouldn't bring, bring a script and he wouldn't bring any words. And he, wouldn't be, he would just come in and start playing. Mm -hmm. So let's let's have a go with this guy. I mean, he wouldn't say if it's a, a boogie or if it's a shuffle or a, if it's a rock song or a blues. He, he would just play, and we would all join in. Myself and Wilger, you know, me and Wilger would get the tempo, and and then I I I played guitar. I mean, I grew up playing guitar before yeah. I switched to bass, so I I could see the chords. I could read the chords when Rory's playing, so I so I could just follow it. And uh, I, I mean, we, we were given a carte blanche. I mean within the song you know i mean the song was there and rory had written the song you know the structure of the song you know but obviously your your, your drum patterns or your, your bass lines i mean i i just threw them in you know added my own my own ideas you know seemed to work that, 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 that was that was that was the process of uh that was, that was rory's uh the writing process yeah. <laughs> And when it came to putting down that first album and, and subsequent albums, it was almost no frills, wasn't it? There was not many overdubs on top of it. It was all kind of recorded live, a couple of mics in the studio sort of thing. That's right, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's what Rory, he always tried try to achieve that sort of live thing in the studio. Uh, hence, we would play the song live. I mean, as far as the solos, I mean, the middle solos and end solos, Rory would do it as a band. Yeah. And then if, if there was any overdubs, it would be a little bit of rhythm guitar. 
but I mean, the solos were all done live. They were all, you know, they weren't created after after the, the recording, you know. So it, it was all literally done live. And the second album, Juice, is even more pertinent to that, you know, that, that really is live, you know. <laughs> so how does that feel then as, as a musician in the studio? Are you doing that song maybe, I don't know, 10 times, 20 times until you get the take that you're happy with? I, I mean, I can remember sometimes we would do one take, uh, and that would be it if, if 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 the feeling was right, you know. Uh, I mean, uh, other songs you're talking about five, six, seven, maybe up to ten takes, you know. I think as the years went on, we did more takes of songs. I think maybe Rory was looking for for you know something else. Um, but in the early days, it, it was fairly straightforward. It was like a bang. It, it was like doing a gig. Yeah. You know. I mean, and and and. And, and you were hot and sweaty after a recording session with Rory as well. You know, I mean, you know, it was like a gig, you know. So, and then you know, even um, I mean, on the first albums, it's a song called Laundromat, which we did three or four takes. I mean, that's a song we never rehearsed. Funny enough, okay. I mean, Rory just brought it into the studio and started playing the riff, and I went, "Wow, this is a riff and a half." Um, so we just joined in, but about so and so, we did five or six takes, um, and the one that Rory picked which was, uh, as far as he was concerned, that the best performance would be done out of the five or six teams. There was a bass mistake on it, and it's been on there ever since. And it, <laughs> that, that sort of irked me at the time. But I can see where Rogue has come from, you know. It didn't matter, you know, it's a, a little bass mistake, a little fluff, you know. But every time I listen to it, I hear it. You know? But it, 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 was, it, it was the performance that Rory was after you. Indeed. And you talk about playing live and things like that. How did how did um, set lists and things like that work with Rory then going on stage? No set list. No set list at all? Rory never used a set list. Wow. Never used a set list, no. Yeah. I mean, Rory would just call the shots. I mean, normally on a tour, <clears throat> you'd you, you find your way. Rory was obviously, you know, he was calling, calling, the, uh, calling the shots. Yep. Uh, you'd normally have maybe the first two songs would remain those first two songs yeah. on that particular tour. But after that, anything went, anything went, <laughs> you know? Wow. I mean, sometimes Rory would just, out of the blue, he, he, he would play like a, a Beatles song, Rain, you know, it, it was a B-side of, 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 I can't remember, Day Trip or something, or not, but anyway. And he just, it's just started playing it. So he just joined in, you know, <laughs> and it was fun. And it kept you on your toes. Always. I was going to say, yeah, did he ever throw in uh, later on any of the kind of album tracks that he'd not played in a while? And it was, it's almost like you've got to remember again and go for him. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I remember, I mean, Cinderboy we used to be on, on, on the first couple of tours, you know, 71, 72. And, and later years, I mean, in the 80s, Brenton O'Neill was drumming at the time and, and Rory just started playing Cinderboy. Brenton had never played it in his life. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, and I could just about remember it. You know, but we, we, we got there. We got we got to the end of the song. Fantastic, yeah. fantastic. Um, and then speaking about the album Calling Card, I mean, that was the first time that um, a, a big name producer was kind of brought in alongside Rory, wasn't it, for, for the recording of the album? It was obviously Roger Glover, legendary figure, both as a producer and as a, a bass player and a musician in himself. But I've heard you say in, in, in the past that it didn't really work. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that? Um, I, th I, th I think there was a, a cluster between Rory and, and uh, Roger as far as the direction they both wanted the album to go. Um, I mean, I think Rory used the producer once in the past with Taste when they did uh, on the boards, uh, Tony Colton Smith, I think, the singer from Heads, Hands and Feet produced the, the, uh, that Taste album. Um, yeah, and, and I think it was just a clash because uh, uh, Roger obviously coming from a, from where he comes from, Deep Purple, you know, yeah. like a you know, very straight rock thing. And, and he was sort of, a, he was heading in that direction, um, which is fine, you know, I mean, you know, and I think Rory was missing the roughness, you know, the rawness, you know, where, uh, where I think Roger was uh, was heading for more like a Deep Purple type sound, you know, obviously we had the keyboards then, and so it was like roughly the same sort of lineup. Let's be purple, you know. I mean, four piece, you know, except for no lead singer. Um, and I think it's a shame, you know, because um, you're sort of caught in between the two of them, you know. I mean, uh, yeah. you know, and, and it, yeah, it, it 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 just didn't work out in the end. It's a shame. It was just a terrible shame. And that's a good album, you know. I mean, it's a great yeah. album, you know. But but uh, you know, I, I can see that there was a certain smoothness in that album that uh, that you wouldn't get with the, in the other Rory albums. And what did you uh, find with working with Roger? Because I, I, as we said, obviously he's a legendary bass player himself. And how did you find getting on with him? 
I, I, I was fine, you know, you know, because I mean, we 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 toured with Deep Purple uh, prior to that seventy uh, three. I think we we did like like a two month tour, you know, in in, in the states with uh, Deep Purple. So so we we were all getting on great, you know. Um, and I like Roger a lot. You I mean you know, and, and uh, obviously being fellow bass players as well, you know. So there's there was uh, something there between us as well, you know. I didn't have a problem with him, but there you go. Such is life, celebrate. <laughs> Such is life, indeed. Um, and as we mentioned, you were really the only real constant, weren't you, with with Rory all the way through twenty years? You're talking two decades. You you recorded on all of his studio albums. You worked with him for so long. So, what was it between the two of you that worked so well? Then, do you think? There was a friendship besides everything else. Besides being musical partners, uh, there was a friendship between Rory and I, a very close friendship. And I think also we, because of from first of all, as I said, I was a guitar player before a bass player, so I could read things. And and, and I know it sounds silly, but I think Rory, we, between us, we had this sort of te telepathy thing. I I can't explain it. I I, I don't want to go down that road. I mean, you know, the, you know. The television thing you know <laughs> but there, there, there was times i could i i, I knew that rory was going to play something before he played it i mean a lick or whatever you know it's just because I'd, I'd been there so for so many years you know and vice versa rory with me as well you know he could read sometimes that i was going to do something beforehand i mean it, it, was, it was just a great combination between the two of us you know Fantastic, fantastic. And um, yeah, well, we, we talk about um, Rory as a guitar player. I mean, he's phenomenal. Everyone knows that. He's one, one of the greatest guitar players we've seen. But as a person, what, what kind of a person was Rory? He is very reserved, very shy. Rory, you know, he, he was, um, he, he kept himself to himself, you know. But at the same time, I mean, when we weren't working, I mean, I'd meet Rory. I'd go up to, uh, you know, to Chelsea or whatever, you know, and, and we'd go out and have a couple of pints and go for a meal and, um, and on the road, uh, especially in the States, because uh, Rory's a big movie fan, and as is, as I, I am as well. So on off days, we'd end up going to see the movies, you know, going go to the movies together, and, uh, you know, he enjoyed that. You know. <clears throat> but he, he liked his own space as well, like we all do, you know. But uh, it, it, it was, um, as opposed to being extroverted on stage as he was he was actually quite introverted off off, off stage you know but we, we could have a couple of wild times as well you know <laughs> so he wasn't that introverted i'm sure you i'm sure you did um and then is there any moments that you kind of look back on now almost that maybe stick in your head and you kind of go wow was that me or did, or did that really happen can you really think of anything like that yeah i mean a couple of things i remember the first time we played belfast obviously in my hometown um and it was during the troubles, and it was it was sort of dangerous to go there at the time, you know. And and, and what sticks in my my mind was the audience that night because they they were even starved of music. I mean, yeah. nobody went there in the seventies, nobody. Uh, and Rory, every year we we would go back there, you know. But the first time he played it would have been seventy one with Wilger. He's God rest him as well. <laughs> They're all gone. <laughs> um, uh, it, it was fantastic. The, the, the atmosphere, and, and that that'll stay with me forever, you know. And 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 you know, because of the dissension between the, you know religions in Belfast, you know, Catholic or Protestant, it, it didn't matter that night. It didn't matter, you know. Nobody gave a damn. Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, whatever, they were all there, you know. And it was just a, a fantastic atmosphere for time, and it, it'll stay with me forever. Phenomenal.